so you're not wasting all of the money, just like half of it. What the f <laughs> Okay, I spoke a little soon. We're back with another pre-built gaming PC on the bench for in-depth review and some torture testing. This time it's the CyberPower i3200 BST. It was $1,050. We bought it at a physical retail store. You can buy them online too. And at the same time, we bought the $900 Dell G5 5000. Do not buy that computer. We have a review of it on the channel. We also bought an iBuyPower computer that is yet to come up in testing, and that one was the cheapest one we bought. But this has the same GPU as the Dell G5 5000. It prices $150 higher. It does have a better CPU. We're going to test them against each other in standardized testing, but we're also going to look at the assembly quality of the CyberPower computer that we paid $1,050 for. Before that, this video is brought to you by ASUS and the ASUS Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard, ready for AMD Ryzen CPUs. The Tough Gaming B550 board comes in ATX and Micro ATX variants with key features, including a Wi-Fi 6 module, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, a fanless chipset heatsink for quiet operation, and a focus on stability and uptime. Learn more about the Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard at the link in the description below. We figured we should try another pre-built because the Dell computer went over so well. Why would you do it that Why? Why would you do any of this? The cooler screwed into the fucking <laughs> case. Our focus today will be on build quality gaming thermals. By the way, horrible thermals. Patrick tested this thing immediately when we got it before I did the teardown. And man, it is... We're gonna need to break out the pressure paper for this one, it's that bad. But anyway, we'll look at that, we'll get noise levels, everything else. But for value, value is hard to measure right now because of the GPU market, but even still, it's an i5 10600KF. Actually pretty good CPU, we'd be fine recommending that for DIY. Uh, and it's got a GTX 1660 Super in it. So the 10600KF is available. It's not like a hard-to-get part, and it's $200 right now when we checked retailers online. The 1660 Super MSRP is $230. Let's say you get gouged for like two times that on eBay. Say you pay $500 for the GPU and $200 for the CPU. That's still only $700. This system costs $1,050. Sure, there's other parts in here. None of them cost that much. Not a single one of these other parts would exceed $100 retail. So we're not really sure where the price came from for CyberPower. It's like... They were in a meeting and said, what should we sell this system for? And someone went, hmm, how about 1,050? And that's what they went with. So uh, terrible value from a pure MSRP perspective. It's not an MSRP market, we know that. Uh, we're gonna look at this anyway, because probably a lot of people will buy this just to get the GPU. And with this one, unlike the Dell system, you at least get non-proprietary parts. So you can actually use this thing. CyberPower has genuinely done a good job in some spots far better than what we've seen in some of the other systems from CyberPower in the past, which have failed our tests very hard. Uh, so there's some upside to this one. It's the first pre-built we've seen that's not complete garbage. And that's, uh, that's pretty high praise from us. As always, a reminder that this review is not meant to be DIY elitism, but we do have standards. There are a lot of good reasons to buy a pre-built gaming PC, and we are going to review this as if you actually want to buy one. There are two main markets right now. There's someone who doesn't care about ever building a computer and just wants to buy something that's pre-built for gaming. And then there's someone who can't get the parts for DIY and they want to buy something to get the parts or because they're tired of waiting. And we're going to look at it from those two perspectives. Let's get started. Before even getting into the teardown, we need to set the stage for the rest of this review. CyberPower has mostly done a good job with small details that we'll look at in the assembly, but they've massively screwed up on the thermals. The thermals are so bad that it's in an utterly unacceptable state out of the box for a customer, especially one who doesn't know really anything about building computers. It could be made into an actually useful computer. That's kind of the sad part. If the buyer is capable of swapping out the CPU cooler and doing some light work, it's not hard to do if you've never done that before either. Simply put, the CPU is throttling under all test conditions. It's actually crazy how bad it is. We'll check in the teardown whether this was caused by a poor mount or not, but under a CPU only workload, not even adding the heat of a GPU into the system, the CPU immediately hit 100 degrees Celsius. We're bouncing off of the maximum junction temperature of the CPU, which means that the CPU is throttling by a couple hundred megahertz in some cases. The fact that CyberPower would ship this thing out the door in this state is embarrassing. 
With a CPU and a GPU workload, our GPU temperature maxes out at 73 degrees Celsius or 87 on the hotspot. It's actually not bad at all, so it's just the CPU that needs a better solution. It doesn't help that the Tiny Cooler Master solution maxes out as well at 1700 RPM, while also running only a 100mm fan on an 80mm heatsink. We mounted a Scythe Fuma 2 to the motherboard just for perspective, and then we flipped the two side exhaust fans around as intake. Our goal was to establish that you can actually make this computer into a really good, competently performing system with about an hour of effort. It's not ideal, but it's workable, unlike Dell's. We reviewed this cooler separately and found it to be good value at $60. It's a high-end solution. You could still get better results with a $30 solution than the stock one, but this shows you the high end of things. In this chart, you can at least see the potential. We're now below 70 degrees Celsius and within roughly the same area for noise. We'd actually be able to reduce the noise substantially from here and still be at 10 degrees cooler than stock. As for those thermal differences, when we swapped the cooler to the Fumo one, we also ran Blender numbers to look at how long does it take to render a single frame from an animation with a 100% CPU load. And the difference was actually measurable. You can see it here. We've got like a couple minutes or so of difference and it, that really adds up frame by frame, and it does mean it'll impact gaming performance as well. Now, unfortunately, we're not really going to know the full extent of the gaming performance impact in this set of tests because Dell is so bad that we don't actually have a, a baseline to compare against that makes sense for the parts. But it is lower than it should be, and that's the part that matters. CyberPower is selling you something that could perform better than it is. Okay, so let's get into the teardown. This is much more standard than the Dell system, so internally, some really obvious things that I see immediately. Uh, it's a downdraft cooler. It's loose, which tells me there's probably a mounting problem. So we're gonna look into that. Next thing I'm noticing is actually a positive. So CyberPower has done really well with cable management. It's actually, it's extremely well done. There's only a couple things I would change. So small attention to detail stuff. They've got this extra eight pin PCIe header that's a daisy chain off the power supply zip tied down here and they've hidden as much of it as they can. I think I would have routed this cable actually through this one instead. It would have been a straighter shot from here to here and looked a little better, but this is still really good. It's a much better uh, starting point than some of the other pre-builds. 24 pin and USB are both tucked in right next to each other. It looks good. A uh, little bit of flex there on the board on the right side. Those are for a VRM heatsink, which is not included on this model motherboard. The fact the holes are there, tells me that this board is being used elsewhere and there is a version with a heatsink available, but this does not have it. The memory's in the correct slot. Let me see if they actually have an option to install four sticks or if it wouldn't fit with this cooler. It can actually fit four sticks as long as they're not too tall. So there's a little bit of clearance there at the edge of the cooler. EPS 12 volt is socketed and cable managed. This fan is cable managed. So I would have routed the HD audio through a different hole. But look, this is actually a really good place to be. The fact that I'm criticizing their choice of grommet for cable routing, that's a good spot. <laughs> like, that means I'm not looking at proprietary motherboards, power supplies, garbage video cards. Uh, well, there's still a chance on this MSI card. This is a much better start than the other one. Let's take the rest of it apart. There, oh my God. MSI, you were. So it's, it's unbelievable how completely incompetent MSI is sometimes. They've made some good products, but when they make bad ones, they make the same mistakes over and over and over. This isn't CyberPower's fault. Uh, they did source the card, but there's the memory modules right there. I was just about to comment on how great it is that MSI has put a thermal pad contacting the memory because Dell didn't do that with its card from whomever they bought theirs from. This thermal pad, however, has about one and a half to maybe two millimeters of contact on the memory module. And the rest of it is just sitting out there. It's not even really under the fan at this point. I mean, it's probably quote unquote within spec, but just if you can make a better product with really not that much change in the bill of materials, i.e. cost, or much of anything else, why wouldn't you do it? This is uh, MSI. And we've, oh, nice. We've got a factory seal on there too. So don't change MSI, I guess. Not that you need me to tell you that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I was gonna take the cooler off. Let's take the motherboard out first. 
This is something we can actually do in this one. The Dell one, the CPU cooler was a uh, load-bearing CPU cooler. So you had to remove it to remove the motherboard from the case. So this is kind of nice. Again, CyberPower, good job on the cable management side of things. Hey, not bad. And the SATA power is plugged in. Wow, impressive. Anyone doesn't know that's a reference to last time we bought a cyber power computer. All right, so we've got the Cooler Master electrical tape special for the RGB cable. Whoever taped this is a pro. They have used a lot of tape in their time at cyber power. Okay, can we now finally remove this thing? We're doing this work on our anti-static mod mat. This is the new large volt version. We have the mediums and the original large in stock. This one's on back order if you'd like to get one on store.cameraznexus.net. If you would like your own PC building surface to protect your table from pre-built nightmares. That should be the name of our new show. License it from Gordon Ramsay. Wow, 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 wow. This thermal paste is, raw. <laughs> it's raw. Well, I think I've found the the problem. This thermal paste crop circle here, you can see lined up on that copper slug on the bottom of the cooler, the cold plate. So the problem then is, uh, first of all, I should note this, Cooler Master makes Intel's coolers, their heat sinks. They are the supplier of the Intel branded stock cooler. So if this looks familiar, that's why. But this looks like one of the larger of the Intel stock coolers with a different fan mounted to it. And uh, it's got a copper slug in the middle and then aluminum contact patch on the outside. The aluminum does not really contact the CPU as evidenced by the fact that we've got this deep circle here and paste sitting basically untouched on the outer edges. So someone probably applied paste uh, with a spreader or a silk screen or something and got it on the whole surface, which is what you should do if it were going to make contact. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, there's not really much pressure. And if you remember, this thing was wiggling around when it was completely torqued. When I went like that, it was sliding around a little bit by about probably about two millimeters of give left and right. So that's what we see here where there's just not, not enough pressure on the outside. And that, unfortunately, is a non-solvable issue. That is not something that we can fix by just mounting this better. It's going to be the nature of this particular cooler. Uh, there should just be a better cooler on it instead. This cooler is phenomenally bad. It's impressive how bad this solution works on this CPU. After seeing that, I need some, some alcohol, so we're going to pour some out for this CPU. Most egregious offense we've seen so far on cyber power system. Kill management, really good job, great attention to detail on the build itself, and that's where it counts. Part selection is not hard to, fi to fix if they decide they want to build something that doesn't suck. So we got one stick of RAM. It is uh, 15, 16, 16, 35, and it's going to be 8 gigabytes of 3,000 megahertz. And we'll talk more about this in the benchmarking section. I think it's running below that spec. All right, for the rest, let's see what we have back on this side. So this is an EVGA power supply. It's a 600 watt. And we can do 18 amps on 3, 3, and 5. And we can do 50 amps on 12 volt. So you do get the full 600 watt capability on 12 volt. That's a good thing. And the drives are initialized this time. Good job, CyberPower. You figured out how to initialize hard drives. Uh, we've had that problem twice now with pre-builds, where there'd be a drive included that's either not initialized or not connected. So CyberPower did tell us that they have a new system since our last review video, where the drive was not initialized, where internally now they run a script at the end of the build and uh, make sure everything is there and working as it should be through some automation. So. Um, that is an improvement. That's one that they did in response to criticism last time, and that's a good thing. I don't think I have any other thoughts on this. Non-modular power supply. What the f***? <laughs> okay. I spoke a little soon. 
Are they just, is this just like, it's just like the Molex centipede or, or does it do something? I actually don't know if this, does this go anywhere? Or is it just like, hey, I don't know what to do with all these cables, boss, what should I do? And then they were like, mm, make art out of it, make a centipede. Okay, so that's going to a fan. The rear fan is this cable, and that's connected, that's spliced into the Molex power. So this is the rear fan. This is the power from the power supply. So that's the power supply cable. That's going to the rear fan. This is going to another fan. What the hell? Cyber Power, I figured out how to save you money, okay? Whoever is doing this, uh, <laughs> this is taking a lot of time, all right? And I know you guys are backed up right now in building, so let's not do this, and then let's use their time to do something else instead. There's a lot of other ways to do this. This is, this is an artifact of choosing fans that have, I, I don't know, they're trying to not use a fan controller, so these are just going to those fans. So they're trying to not use a fan controller for these fans, which is fine. Do they not have headers on the board? One, two, uh, three, four, five, a two, three, four. There's enough headers on the motherboard. We don't need to do whatever this is. It's cleaner on that side, but it's a nightmare on this side. I'm not really sure how I feel about this. Uh, I would not do this. Let's put it that way. I don't, you know, you want as few connections as possible normally. Uh, this makes me a little nervous. Not a lot of power, so they've got that going for them. Wow. Well. One more thing I just noticed as I was about to go reassemble it. Check this out. It's the ASRock B460M Pro 4S AC Revision 1.03. Or, or is it? Da, da, da. It's the B460 Pro 4. Also revision 1.03 apparently. Uh, not scandalous or anything, it just looks like they probably installed a wireless card in it, and then it became the Pro 4 SAC instead of the Pro 4. But that's certainly one way to rebrand the board. We also ran a pressure test to get more of an understanding as to why the cooler ran so poorly when stock. This is measured with special tools that we purchased thanks to support on store.gamertexas.net and Patreon. So thanks to those of you who make this possible. As shown in this chemically reactive pressure measurement, the stock cooler makes actually zero contact with at least half of the IHS. There's contact at the corners, which isn't even close to the silicon, by the way, and there's some at the center. The corners don't really help to heat sink, and the center, being where the die is, is what gets hot, but there's a gaping hole in coverage, even at the central area of the copper slug. The cooler is loose and it applies inadequate pressure here, while also lacking contact between the copper slug and the outer rim of the aluminum square cold plate. So out of the box, the rear IO is covered by a sticker that reads, important, do not connect monitor here, and then indicates the motherboard video ports and smaller print, directing the user to connect to the GPU instead. This CPU uses an FSKU processor without an IGP, and it has a discrete GPU installed. So nothing would happen if the incorrect ports used, and that would potentially lead to an RMA. This is good, but kind of standard now for SIs. The setup process is covered in an admirably brief quick start guide, and it hits the important points while still being short enough that someone might actually read it. Checking for loose cables, correctly connecting the monitor and other peripherals, and setting the mains voltage and power switches on the back of the power supply cover the most common stumbling blocks for new users. The system shipped with the power supply switch in the off position as well, so it is important to tell them to switch it back on. Starting our evaluation with software starts to paint a picture of why a lot of these system integrators are doing a better job than their OEM counterparts, like Dell. Dell had somewhere around 14 control panels and help desks installed on the G5 5000 we reviewed, all of which we'd classify as bloatware. The CyberPower system did not have any pre-installed bloatware at all. There was a web link to their store and a USB key that also redirects to the store for coupons, but that was it. This is a major plus. The OS is actually usable out of the box, 
without needing to uninstall a bunch of useless software that chews away at GPU and CPU resources in the background. So good job by CyberPower. For drivers, CyberPower installed NVIDIA driver 461.4, which is a studio driver from January 26th or so. BIOS is an older version of 1.4, with 1.5 being the newest and from September 9th of 2020. Overall, we're fine on the versions that were used. They're not too out of date for either of these. As for BIOS, that's also fairly straightforward. This is an ASRock board, not a custom one, so it's a standard ASRock BIOS. The BIOS is not able to run the 3000 MHz memory stick beyond 2666. This is an unfortunate waste of potential by CyberPower. The CPU is already an expensive case queue, but the board isn't a Z-series chipset capable of leveraging the higher memory speeds that are afforded by the 10600KF, and of course afforded by the memory stick, which can go to at least 3000. CyberPower should have coupled a more suitable board with the CPU, but of course cost control comes into play somewhere. Power limits are also being locked down on this board out of box, but that's probably a good thing given the lack of the VRM heatsink and the wretched cooling solution that was used on the CPU. Gaming benchmarks are up next. A quick explainer. As always, the performance here is most heavily dictated by the GPU and the CPU, which CyberPower, Dell, et al. do not make. Those parts are made by another party and just bought and installed by the system builder. But that doesn't mean they can't screw that part up. And looking at the price to performance still helps evaluate where each manufacturer spent its money that you paid them. Starting CyberPower with Cyberpunk 2077 benchmarking in our standardized suite, the CyberPower system ran at 63 FPS average, and that's a boost of 17% over the Dell G5 5000 average FPS of 54. That's terrible for the Dell system. It has an i5 10400F not that different from the 10600KF, and we're in a GPU-bound scenario with a 1660 Super for each. CyberPower here has a 17% higher average FPS for 16.7% more money. That actually makes great sense when considering the Dell system also has potential hidden charges that we talked about in the review and proprietary parts that'll relegate it to the landfill once things start dying. At least the CyberPower system has things that you can use in other standard applications. So this is a good start. So in Hitman 3 for CyberPower, we really start to understand the plight of Dell's choices. We ran and reran these tests multiple times, and we've determined that the 65% advantage held by CyberPower is a genuine one. As discussed in our Dell game benchmarks recently, the Dell system has McAfee running in the background with services that hinder performance by using a significant chunk of the 8 gigabytes of system memory, but they also analyze running processes. In this instance, Dell ends up more memory bound than anything else. Although both systems have the same memory capacity, Dell is running four chips on a single DIMM that's low quality and then has the audacity to run nearly a dozen background services that chew away at what remains. This is an embarrassing show for Dell, especially with the same CPU and GPU. In Rainbow Six Siege at ultra settings and 1080p, the CyberPower PC outperforms Dell's G5 by about 12%, or about 27% when Dell's bloatware is running. The 1% lows are also somewhat advantaged on the CyberPower configuration, although the 0.1% lows are not meaningfully different and only start to diverge somewhat once you compare against the bloatware numbers. At 1440p, the CyberPower system manages a 6% advantage while GPU bound. This shows that, at least in this game, a large part of its advantage is in the CPU difference between the 10400F and the 10600K app. The fact that we see a performance uplift is just a bonus when considering the existing advantage of parts that are actually universally usable thanks to their adherence to, you know, standards and form factors. In Red Dead 2 at 1080p and uh, custom high settings, the CyberPower system ran at 61 FPS average. That maintains it above the 60 FPS threshold for the most part, with lows acceptably positioned at 43 for 1%. That affords CyberPower a lead of 13% over the Dell G5 while using the same GPU, but with the CPU difference and more importantly, the build quality difference that's in place. As for noise levels, the CyberPower system idles higher than the Dell system that we tested, but both of them reached about the same noise level once a load was applied. CyberPower's ramp to 38 decibels only takes a few seconds, indicating just how bad the cooling problem is. Because it's nearly instant, the cooler can't keep up and keep the CPU under control, so it immediately spikes to the highest fan RPM that's allowed in BIOS. Overall, though, neither of these systems is overly loud in total, but they're also not cooling effectively, so that's the downside. Our noise floor here is about 26 to 27 dB for reference. We are above that. It's not in unusable territory as far as noise is concerned, but it's extremely inefficient for both of these systems. They could have better solutions in place. So that's it for CyberPower. Let's start with the easy stuff in the recap. First of all, build quality. 
uh, in terms of assembly was very good. CyberPower is on point with cable management and with using parts that are not proprietary. These are all normal form factors. They are all standards. You could take any individual component out of this computer and put it into another computer, and it would work, as long as that other computer also has the same standards. So that's, a, sadly, a very good thing. This system, unfortunately, still gets an F. But it's not an F minus, like in the past. Well, is a 50 an F minus? It's about, a, we'd give it about, if we're going to grade things, don't really believe in grading for consumer products, but if I were going to assign this a grade, it'd be about a 50. The reason it gets a technically failing grade, but one that is recoverable, is because CyberPower has a thermal solution which is overheating. And the problem with that, we're throttling, so we're losing a couple hundred megahertz off the top of all cores on the clock. It's significant. It actually impacted performance. And the problem with that is that a normal user buying this who will never do any kind of work to it is going to run this thing throttling and below the potential performance that it can produce. We're not talking overclocks. We're talking out-of-box performance. This is terrible. It's completely unacceptable. And for that reason, it does technically get a failing grade from us. There is an upside. The upside is the rest of the system is done up fairly well. The motherboard is not a Z-series motherboard. You can't run the memory at the speed you should be able to run it at for a K-series CPU. So that's wasted potential. But the system itself is assembled relatively well. The parts are whatever. They're, they're not high quality, but they do work. And if you replace the CPU cooler and maybe flip around the fans, you'd be in a position where the system is workable. It's a good platform to actually build a computer from. Uh, it is not a good selection of parts for the price. The price and the parts are way out of whack more than ever. And all these SIs and OEMs know that. They are all running higher prices than they probably should be or would typically be because everything is selling out right now. So that's unfortunate, and we can't fix that. But from a a platform perspective, there's something you can work with. So at least there's that. So then, our recommendation, if you buy this, if you are well-versed in computers, cool. You can pull parts out that you want. Uh, and if you wanted to use this as a platform where you're wasting a little bit of money in some places, you'd mostly be wasting it on the motherboard and the CPU cooler. You'd probably want to go buy another stick of RAM because there's a single stick of RAM. It is not going to be running in dual channel. There's no such thing as dual channel RAM, but the SIs will list it like that and the OEMs will list it like that to trick you. That's kind of a, a downside. CyberPower is still doing one stick of RAM in a $1,050 PC. That's stupid. But if you bought this, go buy another stick of RAM, try and match the spec, and probably replace the motherboard, and then replace the cooler. And now you're building a new computer on your own, but you did get a GPU and a CPU with it, uh, so you're not wasting all of the money, just like half of it. Uh, but anyway, it's really sad that this is is the best one we've seen so far. It's, that is so sad, because just it's unacceptable to ship in this state. CyberPower, that cooler, it doesn't matter what it costs you, it has to go. I know you can get, I'm talking to CyberPower, I know you can get a better tower cooler than this that will not overheat and will not be excessively loud with a bill of materials or a cost of like $3 more than this one. The thing's 1050 How much margin do you need? That's what I have to say to CyberPower. I've seen the bill of materials on coolers. I know what's out there. Couple bucks more, way better. So uh, let's get with that, CyberPower. Get it to a state where, in the very least, you're only overcharging, but it works well out of box, and it runs spec out of box. And then I'll be uh, not happy, but we'll be in the middle. Well, the only complaint we'll have then is the price. That's not a bad place to be. Look at NVIDIA. That's the main complaint against NVIDIA's products. Anyway, I don't know. This is, it's really a challenge to review pre-built because it's, it's always like what you're looking for, the bar is just so low. And I don't want to settle because I don't want our viewers to settle for something that's garbage and ripping them off. But it's better than Dell. So that's it for this one. Uh, I would definitely buy this over Dell's, but that's about the best I can say about it. It is uh, a starting place. Thank you for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. If you'd like to buy one of our toolkits, mod mats, mouse pads, mouse mats, or other items on the store, like our bar runners. And you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for some bonus behind the scenes videos, like where we have Patrick Stone talking about power supply testing and explosions. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.